Good morning. Scripture reading will be in the book of Luke this morning, so if everyone would open your Bibles to Luke, we'll be reading in chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the st stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. The congregation says, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Wow, great to see everyone today. You guys sound excited about worshiping God today for some reason. That's always a good thing. Okay, I got to get that out of my way. What a great thing it is to have classes starting again and able to have kids around again and uh, all of that. They've, they've been enjoying all of that, and so it's always great to do that. Um, we want to talk about resurrection today. Are you surprised? <laughs> nah, it's, see, then you've got to really come up with something because you guys were expecting this already, and that's the way it is. Resurrection is perhaps the most important thing that happened in all of history. At least that's what I believe. Now, not everyone believes that. Some people barely even notice that resurrection took place. And so it wasn't important. It wasn't there. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I just wasn't, I wasn't hearing me, so just making sure I'm still here. Have you ever had that where you disappear on yourself? <laughs> it's one of the most important things that happens in all of our history. And Jesus came and was born on earth, and he trained his 12 disciples. He trained them what to do to go out and to preach and to teach. And so he was right there with them. And we see that he told them about what was going to happen in Jerusalem. He told them that he was going to be mistreated. He was going to be able to hand it over to sinful men. He told them all about this, and he told them about the fact that there were, he would be mistreated, he would be spit on, he would be mocked, and then he would be killed or crucified, and on the third day he would rise again. And all of this happened. We can see the story as it unfolds throughout the gospel. We can see how he taught his disciples. And then there's the Garden of Gethsemane. And then there's Judas. And then there's all the soldiers. And then they come and they take Jesus away. And they take him away to a trial, which isn't really a trial. And then he is crucified between two thieves. And on Sunday morning, we have Luke 24. On Sunday morning, it is one of those most intense times, the first day of the week at early dawn. The women go to the tomb. They think there's still more left to do. Have you ever noticed that? The women never trust men to do a, the job right. I mean, Nicodemus and Cornelius had already been there, and they had been able to take care of the body. They'd taken it off the cross, and they had buried it, and, but the women are going back to the tomb now to have additional spices to be able to 
put those on. And they wonder about the stone. They hadn't planned that. But when they get there, the stone's rolled away. It's not a problem. And they don't see any body. Jesus is no longer there. But there are two men there. I don't know what dazzling apparel looks like. But how amazing that must have been to see those two men there and to realize what had happened. And they, they tell him, he isn't here. He is risen. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Uh, how do you answer that kind of a question? Well, we just thought we'd drop by with spices. Um, but they tell them this story, the same story. So the angel announcement to them, don't you remember he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men, that he would be crucified, and on the third day he would rise again. And it is the same every single time the story is told. On the third day he would rise again. Now, I can see telling the story and a few details get left out. He will be killed. He will be crucified. Okay, same thing, right? But on the third day, every single time this story is told, it is told as on the third day, he will rise again. If you ever get one detail right in the story of Jesus, it's that one that every single person, including angels, got correct. On the third day, he will rise again. And so what is it about this? Let's take a look at this for a little bit. His goal was resurrection. His goal was to sit at the right hand of God. Just like we want to see our kids grow up, his goal is to see the church begin, to see his people carry out his work. It's one of those things that's so important and so amazing. We don't want our kids, I mean, we'd kind of like them to stay home, but no. We're always glad when they grow up and they go into other things and they're able to be mature, and that's what we wanted in the first place. But resurrection is central to all of this. It's the beginning point. There is no point in dying to self and taking up the cross if, if, if there is no resurrection. That's what's most important. And so, resurrection is everything. Do you ever know what day it is with Jesus? We don't get any of those, do we? On Monday, Jesus went to... There are no Mondays. There are Sabbath days, because that was their day of worship. But other than that, we really don't know what day it is. There, there's not an indication. And so... For anybody to keep track of any days of what went on, Jesus seems not to have important days. Now, there were feast days that were important. There was Sabbath days, but that's because those are worship days. And yet, every single time on the third day, why does he say this? Why does that become so important? And so I want you to just think about this for a little bit. Why would he make this so important? And I don't know that I'd ever even noticed it before. It's just on the third day, right? But why would he say this? Well, I've got guesses. I don't really have any proof of any one of those things, but I have some guesses that maybe he wanted them to realize that he was setting an appointment. It's the only appointment he ever sets and keeps. On the third day, I will rise again. And so he tells them when to expect him. Well, that's a good thing. You like to know when things are going to happen, when people can expect you. And so don't be looking on day two. I'm not coming back then. It'll be on the third day. And so they don't have any doubt. They don't have any reason to lose faith because after all, Jesus died and he's supposed to be resurrected. And well, but he just died this morning. It's on the third day. And so they recognize this. It would be important also that he be dead. How fast could God actually do this? I mean, if you're dead for 10 seconds, would that count? You're dead. 
There's no heartbeat. There's no breath. All right, so now he can rise from the dead again, right? Makes it easier. Don't, you know, don't have to have the tomb and the big stone and all that. He died, and now he's risen again, and we wouldn't believe it. We would question it. At least a lot of people would question it. I'm not sure he really died. How long do you have to be dead for someone to believe that you're really dead and that it takes a resurrection for you to get up out of the tomb? I'm going to take a wild guess and say three days, right? Because how much shorter would it be? And when we start thinking about this, it's important that they do know that he did die and that he had planned all of this. Why not four days like Lazarus? Lazarus was in the tomb four days. Could have done four days, right? Could have been two days. But no, he sets the appointment on the third day because after all, we could do all of this really quick. And that's the thing I want you to think about today is we assume God is instant. And this seems to suggest that God is not instant, that he is going to allow process with all of these things. And so our life is not, you know, 10 seconds long. Well, that's a good thing, right? There's a process. We have to go through childhood and growing up and all of these other things. And so it's a process. Could he have made us to live for 10 seconds? Yeah. Or a day, two days. Have the lifespan of a fruit fly. No, that, but God doesn't do it like that. And so maybe there's a reason why all of these things happen. I don't think Jesus could come back on Sabbath. I think that would be a violation of what Sabbath was about, not a fulfillment of Sabbath, because Sabbath is long before any law, and Sabbath is about a day of rest, and then here comes Jesus. No, I think it wouldn't be then. And the particular Sabbath that occurs in between is a Passover Sabbath. It's when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, and they were told to take a lamb, and to offer the lamb and to put the lamb's blood on the doorpost and then the angel would pass by. And so forever after that, this was known as Passover because all the Egyptian children died but not the Israelite children because of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And I think God links all of these things together to say, do you remember that? look at this. And so it wouldn't be Sabbath. It certainly wouldn't be Passover feast, which is where they were. And then the other idea is that, you know, Jesus was busy during that time. There was a lot going on. He wasn't just laying there going, oh, three days, I have to wait. We hate to wait, right? Don't like to stand in lines, don't like to have to wait. And so, but Jesus was busy. You see, there's this battle that goes on in heaven. And Satan is being cast out at the time of the cross. And you're able to see this battle that goes on. And whether it's all in heaven or partly in hell, at least Jesus now has power over Satan. He takes away his power of death so that he no longer has that power of death. And Jesus comes out of this battle with the power of death. And also, he's the sacrifice for sins, and so that sacrifice would have needed to be offered. How long does that take? And then the other one is he wanted to rise on the first day of the week to start something new. And so on the first day of the week, on Sunday, he is specifically setting this as a different example to any other ones that have been before. On the first day of the week, Jesus is going to rise from the dead. The stone is rolled away to reveal an empty tomb. Jesus is already gone. It wasn't there to let him out. I think he could get out however he chose. But it's just there to say, come in and look. There's nobody here. And the angels are left to be able to tell the story. And he appears to the disciples on the first day of the week. 
and he appears the next first day of the week, and the next first day of the week, and every single first day of the week after that, perhaps not in physical appearance as he did the first couple of times, but certainly when we take of communion today, he takes it new with us in his kingdom, and so that is part of where Jesus appears on the first day of the week, and he's here with us today. I think we tend to think of immediate results. I mean, communication has gotten faster. We can do so many more things. But we never thought God took any time, right? I mean, God is instant. And we see a lot of that because when God decides to heal someone, it's immediate. And so healing seemed to take place as immediate things. Get up, take up your bed and walk. Immediately, he's strengthened. He can take up his bed. He can walk. He's able to go wherever he wants to. But maybe it's not so immediate. We need time to think. And maybe we need time to allow for God to do things. And maybe it's not really allowing for God to do things as much as it is waiting for us to be able to process what takes place. It could all take place in two seconds, but it doesn't. And God seems to allow the process. And so, on the third day, I will rise. Whichever reason is there, or all of the reasons that are there. I mean, we look at this all the way through creation, and we look at how creation is made. It's not all in one day. Are the one days 10 seconds long than the first day he said? Well, I don't know. You have to ask somebody else to debate those things. You know, how long are those? And we begin to look at some of those things and try to say, well, how long would it take God? Why does he wait so long for Jesus to come? We could have Adam and Eve, right? They go into the garden and they're planted in the garden and they sin and they're thrown out of the garden, so sin is in the world, and their first child is Jesus. And Jesus dies on a cross, and we're all good. No, why does he wait so long? There's a lot of sin that happens in the world before Jesus ever gets here. But then there's a lot of faith that happens in the world before Jesus ever gets here. And you can see great men of faith who believe in God and believe in what God is doing and believe that God is going to fulfill promises. And there are prophecies that are made, and these people live with this great faith, knowing that God will do what he promised he would do. And we just have to let God work out the timing. And that's what we see in the Old Testament is the timing of God as he begins to work all through all of these things. The three days is a link to a lot of things from the Old Testament as well. Did you realize when Moses brings the people to Mount Sinai, he tells him, I want you to consecrate the people for two days. And on the third day, God comes down on top of Mount Sinai and speaks the Ten Commandments. They know that. We may not remember that, but they know that. They know that's what happened. Jesus makes the reference to Jonah and the great fish, and just like Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days in the heart of the earth. Now, he's making that for them and expecting them to remember clear back to Jonah and what Jonah was all about and about the timing of God that Jonah was sent to preach to some people who needed to repent. And yeah, it's kind of the same story that goes along. And now we're to someone who needs to repent. But the one I see as the most important is found in Genesis 22. And it just describes this. It's with Abraham, and after his son Isaac has already been born, it says, after these things, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham. And he says, here I am. 
He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled the donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. I and the boy will go worship and come to you again. Not I will go, we will go, and I will come. No, it's together. And so Abraham's told to go and sacrifice Isaac. Well, that's wrong. Everything about it says that that's wrong. That can't possibly happen. It's not the right thing to do. You don't kill children. It's, nothing's right about it. And so they go three days to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And he tells his servants, you guys stay here. It's a three-day journey to God. Does that make sense? And he acts out the sacrifice of Jesus as an offering to God. Abraham's faced with a dilemma. Am I obedient to God or not? Because God has asked me to go and kill Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. But then that means I've lost my inheritance, my promise, and God is no longer able to have his promise. Because Isaac is the one child of promise, and all the rest of the promises depend on Isaac growing up and being good, and now he's asked me to go and kill Isaac. And it doesn't make any sense. He's killing the promise of God. He's killing his own inheritance. And yet, can you disobey God and say, no, you don't got this right. This isn't good. You need to but Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham believes God, and he comes to this conclusion that I'm going to do both. I'm going to be obedient to God, and I'm going to keep the promise of God. And God, the only way this can happen is by resurrection. And God can bring him back to me. And it is at that point that the angel stops him and says, okay, good enough. That story is about resurrection, and it is the enactment of what Jesus goes through. I think all this stuff is linked. God seems to know that all this is going on, and it's amazing to be able to see how this works. Well, we've been following the Gospel of Luke for a while now and talking about different things that happen in Luke. And in Luke, the story goes three days. On the third day, he will rise again. And that's all it says. It doesn't make a reference to why or anything about that. The other three Gospels do. And they give you a different reason why all of this is going to happen. And so I want to share with you a little bit about what that means. The first time is in John chapter 2 and verse 13. And it says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making, and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And he was speaking about the temple of his body. 
And when therefore he was raised up from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so Jesus goes and he clears the temple of the corruption that was in the temple at that time. Uh, he does it in a fairly violent way as well, turning over tables that were not card tables. These are a couple of hundred pounds that he throws over. And any time you start throwing money around, it's going to create chaos. And then you've got all the animals in there, and they seem to be creating more chaos. And so it is a fairly chaotic scene and a fairly violent scene. And he says, this is my Father's house. You will not make it a house of trade. And so this passage is found only in John. None of the other gospels include it. It's the first cleansing of the temple. The other three include the cleansing of temple at the end of his ministry, but this one is there at the beginning. I want you to realize why he says this and why he sets this up. Because Jesus is there and they're like, okay, they're kind of used to crazy prophets. All right? There's been a lot of crazy prophets through the years. Elijah says, it's not going to rain. Oh, why? Well, because you guys are wicked. And it doesn't rain. And some of them have really bizarre you know, behavior. And so they don't really know quite what to do. And so here's a guy who comes in and he starts throwing up about all the other tables and driving people out. And he seems to have this great rage about it all. And, and as you look at all this, it's kind of confusing. And they're like, okay, so are you a prophet telling us something or are you just crazy? No, he's a prophet telling them something. Do not make my father's house a house of, of trade. And Jesus answers from a prophet, destroy this temple, meaning the temple of his body, and in three days I will raise it up. It's on purpose. And he begins at the beginning of his ministry saying, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, this is a common reference in the New Testament when we talk about the church as being the body of Christ or the temple of the Holy Spirit, and, but not so much Old Testament. You don't really see that in Old Testament. You see it beginning here, and so Jesus begins to change the perception, of course, what they are thinking is the temple. You know, the thing that is now Herod's temple, not even the original temple from Solomon. And it took, they're, they're saying, 46 years to build this, and it's big. I know this is just the scale model, but it's huge. And one guy's going to do this? They don't really know what to do with that. But this is the sign you've cleared everybody out of this temple and you're going to take this temple and you're going to tear it all down and in three days you're going to build it all by yourself. I don't think the disciples joined in. There's not really a record of them joining in in the mayhem and throwing everybody out. It appears just to be Jesus. And they're thinking, Jesus, you're going to build all of this by yourself? You can't do that. That's an impossibility. But no, Jesus wants them to know that. Jesus wants them to remember that. That is the whole point. And it is eventually what kills him. He means the temple of his body. Because as they get close to the time of his death, they begin looking for witnesses false witnesses, any kind of witness, anybody who will say anything against Jesus. In Matthew 26 and verse 60, it says they didn't find any. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? 
What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. They finally got him. He said he would rebuild the temple in three days. And Jesus did make that statement. And they remember that statement, and he wants them to remember that statement because he's planned all of this, and he's even given them the very ammunition that it would take to crucify him from the very beginning. And now they're looking for it. It wasn't a mistake. He tells them what it's about. On the third day, I will raise it up. And when they begin to ask, Jesus is silent until they pressure him. And then he says, you said it. You said so. And you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And they get all excited. Wow, that's blasphemy. We finally got a reason we can kill him. They've been looking forever. You notice how hard it is to do bad things to good people? I mean, trying to feel good about it anyway. And and so, no, they've got a reason now. And it is that statement, I will raise it up in three days, that makes all of the difference. They do take him out and they do crucify him. And so in Matthew 27, we see the text reads this way in verse 38, the two robbers were crucified with him one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. The thieves picked it up. If you're the Son of God, let's get off of here. Do that for us. Do that for you. And those passing by are doing the same thing. They're saying, if you're the son of God, because we know, and now every single person in Jerusalem knows, you said, tear down the temple and you would rebuild it in three days. It is one of the most important points of faith. And Jesus picks it so they will know what he has done. Their answer is, save yourself and come down from the cross. And his answer is, no, I can save you through my cross. And Jesus was busy for those days. He defeated Satan. He will have the power over death. And resurrection becomes possible for us all. Because here's what happened. For Christ has entered not into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it offered to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. And so Jesus entered into the holy place into heaven itself into the place to appear before God to be the sacrifice to be the one who was killed to be the one who carried all of our sin on him and it is by his blood not just the one on the cross but the one he took into heaven itself By his blood, he put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. He offered once to bear the sins of many. And he built 
a new temple. A place where we can worship because we have a new high priest. Because now we have access to that place. Because he now gives us the resurrection power and we can rejoice in the sacrifice. And he's going to come again because we're waiting for him. And he paid the price for our sin and he is our sacrifice. Are you ready for that? Well, maybe in three days, right? He's risen from the grave, and we can come to life too, and a lot can happen in three days. How long does it take us to realize it? I don't know about you, but have you ever had the experience of saying, okay, God, I repent, I'm going to do better? And it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. God, did you hear me? Did you know what I said? Oh, we pray for something. And it's like, I don't know when it's going to take place. And it seems to be a while before it's going to take place. And we go, okay, in your time. But we need to forgive someone. And we would ask for forgiveness or someone needs to forgive us. And so we would say, I'm sorry. But you still feel bad, right? When is it ever going to click in to go, okay, and we're good again? Maybe in three days. I have no proof on any of this, but I don't think we adjust quite that quickly. I'm sorry, I never should have said that, I never should have done that, I never should have whatever. And we are automatically back to grace again and forgiven and completely free and our mind is like, yay, let's rejoice. No, we're probably still hanging on to it a little bit going, do you know what I mean? Do you understand? I'm trying to make this right. And I think God works in process. A lot can happen in three days. And he gave us grace. Do you get that the very first day? And he redeemed us. And how does redemption feel two seconds after? Or does it kind of kick in three days later and you realize, okay, this is what's happened to me. And it's not that God is not able to do things in an instant, but I'm not sure we're able to process them in an instant. And we have the Holy Spirit. And you know that, right? But sometimes it's the processing. I've got the Holy Spirit. I don't have to worry about any of this. And I've been redeemed and I've been forgiven and I am no longer guilty and I am able to praise and I am able to worship. How long does it take to realize the blessings of God? Give yourself three days. If we can feel it, feel the forgiveness and feel the grace and feel the redemption and feel the answer to prayer that can be in three days. And when you get angry and you say, okay, stop. Somehow it just doesn't stop, does it? Somebody did something and you're, you, it's still kind of, give yourself three days. Or spend three days with God. See if you can get to a new life. All of this is just practical stuff. It's not doctrinal stuff. How long does dedication take? It might take only an instant. But there are other examples of this. It took Saul three days being blind and fasting before Ananias was ever sent. And then he's ready after three days. And Jesus comes, and I don't know where all he went and what he did. Yes, I've got some ideas, and I know the results of what happened, but how long did all that take place, and where was he and which one, and did it all happen in three seconds? 
or did it take three days or but Jesus is very specific on the third day today is that third day today is Sunday when Jesus rose today is the Sunday that we can rejoice and celebrate our redemption our forgiveness the grace of God, the Holy Spirit that was within us. If you can't rejoice at that yet, boy, let us help you with that. Let us pray for you. Let us baptize you into Christ. Let us do whatever it takes to get you close to God so that you can feel that, so that you can understand and know. Maybe it doesn't take three days. But give God time to sink into your life and yourself time to find his answers. Let's praise God. Let's stand and sing.